Dumping syndrome is a group of symptoms that occur when food reaches the small intestine too rapidly. So basically it's a condition that occurs when stomach releases its content into duodenum abnormally fast. This condition called rapid gastric emptying. And this rapid gastric emptying causes severe stress for gastrointestinal organs below stomach, primarily duodenum, because they are not ready for so fast income of stomach content. And this severe stress manifests as a group of symptoms. These symptoms are very variable, for example, it can be gastrointestinal symptoms as epigastric pain or systemic manifestations as tachycardia or even syncope. It all depends on type and severity of dumping syndrome. But very important to understand that all of these symptoms develop due to the same pathological event, which is rapid gastric emptying. Dumping syndrome manifests usually after gastric surgery in 25-50% to of patients. And also important that clinically significant symptoms, as for example epigastric pain, abdominal cramps, diarrhea or dizziness, develops only in 5-10% to of all patients with dumping syndrome. Nowadays, there is increase in incidence of dumping syndrome that is related primarily due to increase in gastric bypass surgery. This surgery performs in patients with morbid obesity. And because the incidence of obesity and also morbid obesity increase, the incidence of dumping syndrome increased too. Term dumping is first used in 1920 by Andrews and Mix, when they absorbed rapid gastric emptying of contrast from the stomach to duodenum in patients with abdominal and vasomotor symptoms of dumping syndrome. Before dumping syndrome discussion, it's important to mention how normal gastrointestinal physiology works. In relation to dumping syndrome, we can define three major stomach functions. Reservoir function, digestion function and gastric emptying function. Generally, all of these functions are regulated by autonomic nervous system and gastrointestinal hormones. Now about each function in details. First of all, gastric reservoir function. Even before food enters stomach, stomach reservoir capacity begins to increase. This happens due to the reflex that called receptive relaxation. The mechanism of receptive relaxation is that when food comes through esophagus to stomach, the esophagus wall stretches. This stretching is sensed by stretch receptors that transmits this signal about incoming food to stomach. And stomach reacts with relaxation of fundus and the upper body. And because it's proximal parts of the stomach, the reflex also called proximal stomach relaxation. When food enters stomach, stomach begins to accumulate food for further digestion. The amount of food that stomach can accumulate depends on three factors. Gastric volume, gastric accumulation reflex and gastric sphincter state. First of all, the higher is the gastric volume, the higher amount of food the stomach can store. The second factor is gastric accumulation reflex. The function of this reflex is to increase gastric compliance. So what we mean by gastric compliance? Basically compliance describes how easily something changes its shape in relation to stomach. It shows how easily and to what extent stomach can dilate. From physiology we know that pressure is equal to volume divided on compliance. This formula tells us that any rise in volume of the food inside the stomach inevitably leads to rise in intragastric pressure. And the only factor that can minimize this rise in pressure is compliance. So by increasing gastric compliance, stomach can store more food with only minimal increase in intragastric pressure. The mechanism of gastric accumulation reflex is that during fasting, muscle fibers of the proximal stomach remains in tonically contracted state. This tonic contraction is generated by nervous vagus. But when food enters stomach, it begins to distend the gastric wall and the signal of gastric wall distension is transmitted by vagal afferent pathways to brainstorm and from brainstorm by vagal afferent pathways to stomach and this signal causes proximal stomach relaxation. Because there are vagal afferent as well as vagal afferent pathways, this reflex is also called vasovagal gastric reflex. So by increasing gastric compliance, gastric accumulation reflex increase stomach reservoir capacity to provide temporary storage of ingested food. And also by minimizing rising intragastric pressure, this reflex regulates gastric emptying rate. 
And the third factor, stomach function is usually depends on gastric sphincter state, especially pyloric sphincter that regulate food transition from stomach to duodenum. Because when intragastric pressure begin to increase, at some point it can exceed the resistance of pyloric sphincter. And when it happens, the stomach is empty. So the more disrupt pyloric sphincter state, the lower is the pyloric resistance. And the lower is pyloric resistance, the earlier comes this point when pyloric resistance can deal with high intragastric pressure and this leads to premature gastric emptying. The premature stomach emptying called rapid gastric emptying. The problem with pyloric sphincter is that even in normal condition is quite a short and poor barrier, so the resistance of pyloric sphincter is low and because of that it can resist only a small pressure gradient. So even a small pathological changes in gastric reservoir capacity that will cause increase in intragastric pressure or pathological changes in pyloric sphincter state that will cause decrease in pyloric sphincter resistance will lead to a rapid gastric emptying. The another important concept is that stomach, duodenum, biliar tract and pancreas are closely related embryologically and thereby they function as one integrated unit. And because they function as one integrated unit, negative changes in one of them have a dramatic negative effect generally on a whole functional unit and in particular on pyloric sphincter state. The another concept is that the highest intragastric pressure, the highest gastric wall distension, and the highest gastric wall distension, the highest sense of satiety. So high intragastric pressure causes gastric wall distension and gastric wall distension gives sense of satiety. So how to consume less food and have the same sense of satiety? Or we can say, how with decrease in stomach content keeps the same intragastric pressure? The answer is by reduction in stomach volume. For example, we have stomach volume that is fully filled with intragastric content. And this stomach content causes some pressure on gastric walls. We call this pressure intragastric pressure. And this intragastric pressure causes distension of gastric wall. And gastric wall distension gives sense of satiety. The higher is gastric wall distension, the higher will be sense of satiety. And in the second case, we take reduced stomach volume, but fully filled stomach with reduced volume will give the same intragastric pressure. That will cause the same gastric wall distension, and the same gastric wall distension will give the same sense of satiety. So with decreased volume of stomach, we need less volume of food to fulfill stomach, but intragastric pressure will be the same for fulfilled stomach with greater volume or fulfilled stomach with reduced volume. And if intragastric pressure is the same, the same will be gastric wall distension that will give the same sense of satiety. So the central concept of bariatric surgery is that with decrease in stomach volume, the patient needs less volume of food to provoke sense of satiety. And with decrease in food consumption, the less nutrients will absorb in duodenum and this will result in weight loss. As the reservoir function provides food storage, the digestion function makes food more easily to absorb in duodenum by gastric secretion and trituration of food. The digestion function hugely depends on reservoir function. The concept is that digestion takes time and reservoir function by increase in gastric compliance prevents rise in intragastric pressure with premature gastric empty. So pyloric sphincter resistance will be sufficient to hold this food in stomach until food is properly digested. When food is properly digested by coordinated activity of gastric motility and relaxation of pyloric sphincter that are both regulated primarily by nervous vagus activity, chyme enters duodenum. And when food enters duodenum, the duodenum wall begins to distend, and this distension activates the duodenal mechanoreceptors. The duodenal mechanoreceptors inhibit nervous vagus activity, and this inhibition of nervous vagus activity results in temporarily reduced gastric emptying rate. As the duodenum empties, the duodenal wall distension decreases, and inhibition of nervous vagus diminished, and thereby gastric emptying rate became restored. This inhibitory feedback called duodenal feedback mechanism. The same inhibitory feedback as with gut mechanoreceptors due to gut distension occurs with duodenal osmoreceptors when they detect hypertonic chyme 
and visdodel mucosal nerve endings when they sense hyperacidic pH. Basically, receptors sense that something wrong with chyme and inhibit gastric emptying rate. The other name for these reflexes are enterogastric reflexes, to emphasize where reflex is born and where the final destination is. Also, because nutrients are absorbed in small intestine, for absorption it's necessary to have enough of small intestine length, or we can say enough of functional enterocytes, because it's a problem, for example, in patients with short bowel syndrome or with surgery like gastrojejunostomia, where duodenum is bypassed. All these functions are regulated by autonomic nervous system and gastrointestinal hormones. First of all, about autonomic nervous system. We know that autonomic nervous system is divided on extrinsic part and intrinsic part. Extrinsic innervation includes sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. Parasympathetic innervation from esophagus to splenic flexure is provided by nervous vagus. And the nervous vagus innervation is immensely important for a proper gastrointestinal regulation. Recall that stomach receptive relaxation in response to esophagus distension is mediated by nervous vagus. Also, gastric accumulation reflex mediated by nervous vagus. Gastric secretion and gastric motility are also mediated by nervous vagus. Duodenal feedback mechanism inhibit gastric emptying rate through nervous vagus. Also, gastric sphincter state are controlled by nervous vagus. One important feature of nervous vagus for dumping syndrome discussion is that the trunks of nervous vagus are going down to stomach by esophagus wall. The second part of autonomic nervous system is intrinsic innervation that is provided by enteric nervous system. And it's important to mention that adaptability of enteric nervous system is unique for every human. In some patients, enteric nervous system adapts quite easily to any changes in chyme as increased chyme osmolarity or increase in chyme volume, but in some cases the adaptability of enteric nervous system is so low that even a small changes in chyme results in clinically significant symptoms. Also, gastrointestinal tract have massive hormonal regulation. For the sake of our discussion, we will talk only about hormones that are playing a key role in dumping syndrome. For example, vasointestinal peptides, serotonin and bradykinin. We will discuss the mechanism of action of these hormones when we will talk about pathogenesis of clinical symptoms of dumping syndrome. Now, as we discuss how gastrointestinal physiology works, we can discuss what etiologic factors can lead to development of dumping syndrome.